Uh, we'll start with Representative Reed. Representative Reed uh, is a member of the Connecticut House. She's the House Chair of the Energy and Technology Committee. Uh, the way Connecticut works, the House and Senate sit together at the committee level. So they have a joint committee, which is actually a very effective model uh, for those of you who are used to a different system. Uh, er earlier in her legislative career, she served in the legislature for 10 years. She received the prestigious Toll Fellowship Award from NCSL. Uh, she's been instrumental in the state's comprehensive energy strategy and certainly all the things that we think about with regard to nuclear carbon, uh, reliability, all of those are a key part of the state's comprehensive energy strategy. Prior to her political career, she was actually an award-winning journalist. Uh, she worked across the nation, starting in Seattle, uh, then in television stations in Florida, Connecticut, and New York. She was a contributing correspondent to CBS News. That's why if she looks familiar, that's, that, that would be why. Uh, she was a, uh, she'd been a White House correspondent. She hosted Off the Set, a political talk show in New York, uh, and she's been honored for her investigative reporting. Uh, she's also uh, headed a filmmaking and television production company, and uh, she lives in Branford, uh, Connecticut, and spends uh, time traveling all over the country to keep up with her family. And with that introduction of Representative Reed, I'm going to actually ask her a, uh, a just sort of a, 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 a teen off question, if you will. Connecticut spent two years working on legislation to preserve the state's only nuclear unit, and I've got to editorialize here, Dominion Energy's nuclear unit at Millstone. That uh, legislation had a lot of ups and downs, a lot of House and Senate back and forth, a lot of involvement by the Malloy administration. And as with a lot of hard accomplishments, how did you get to yes? What, what, what sort of lessons can we draw? Well, we had to humanize the nuclear discussion. I mean, speak about it in terms of how it impacts not only communities, but the whole global warming uh, issues that everybody is incredibly concerned about. Um, Connecticut is on the Long Island Sound, and the uh, sound has been rising. So people are actually experiencing this in real ways. At high tide now, a lot of the country roads, uh, the serious country roads that wind, that connect uh, a lot of our shoreline towns are flooded. Um, a lot of our, our railroads uh, are at risk because those tracks run along the coast. Um, people are, are seeing it, and to connect those dots was really important. Uh, I, I looked around at one point and I realized that a lot of the, um, the anti-nuclear advocates, which we have a lot of, um, were some of those folks who were um, protesting the nukes when they opened in the 70s. Like, old people are living too long, I decided. I thought, <laughs> why don't she retire already? And so they were excited to be against nuclear again. And in, in uh, New England, I was talking to a nuclear engineer uh, last night, a young man from um, the South, and he was really surprised to learn that there were anti-nuke people still around. And uh, so it's good to travel and to look around and understand how different re regions approach things differently. But we had to really, uh, the millstone units, uh, there are two units, um, are uh, 2,100 megawatts. It's more than 50% of Connecticut's energy. It's uh, the biggest generator in all of New England, and we are combined uh, with ISO New England. ISO New England is, you know, the FERC entity that regulates us all. So we actually, you know, some of the states, Maine, uh, a legislator from Maine told me the other day, oh, we don't have nukes and we get along without them. And I said, excuse me, you're burning our electricity. <laughs> we send it to you from Connecticut. And so trying to also convince the region that they have a stake in this. Um, you know, we've shut down nukes in um, Vermont, Yankee has shut down. Um, Massachusetts is shutting down. Um, these two um, power plants, and they're beautifully operated, I have to say. I give you kudos. I was a journalist uh, for many, many years, and, I, and energy was one of my beats when there actually was journalism. That's a whole other issue. Um, you know, trying to tell the story with very few journalists who really understand the energy lane and are not um, experts in it at all. They've never been to any kind of a plant. They run around the Capitol and do interviews, and they don't really understand the, the big context. But, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, um, you know, to try to tell that story and to connect those dots and to explain to people what those impacts are going to look like, um, really important. And I always start to say, so Northeast Utilities, which is now Eversource, uh, the biggest utility in New England, used to run um, the, those nuclear plants. There were three. Now there are two. And... Um, and they were really bad at it. 
we did not manage those plants well. And Dominion came in when you bought them. We deregulated our utilities, people, which gives us a different construct from a lot of other states. So our utilities don't generate anymore. They just distribute energy, uh, which is a whole other interesting hoop to jump through. But Dominion came in and really professionalized that operation. And it's, it's really been exceptional. So trying to tell that story uh, took us two years, but we managed to do it. Okay. If I could ask a follow-up question, if you read the paper, if you watch political news, or certainly if you look at, uh, at, the, uh, at social media, you are sort of told a story that Republicans and Democrats never agree, ever. Everything's shirts and skins, R&D, red and blue. And yet, looking at the vote in Connecticut, you had a bipartisan vote. What do you attribute that to? So one thing, when they um, asked me to take over to be the House Chair of Energy, so we do have the ho mm -hmm. House and Senate um, participation in all committees, which is fabulous. And now the state Senate is 50-50%. Uh, so this year I had two Senate chairs, a Republican and a Democrat. And it's always been my policy to bring everybody in from jump. Mm -hmm. I want them in on the original discussions. I don't like bills, particularly complicated bills that have a lot of moving parts, to be determined by one party and then everybody else is, you know, well, we have the numbers, come on board. You can't do that with something as complicated as energy policy. So I bring everybody in and we, you know, we had battles and, um, and but we worked it through and we came up with a product that everybody felt they were a stakeholder in, which is really important. They felt ownership and a level of pride of getting it through. And that's really how we do it, uh, did it. But it really, it did take two years. Very good. We'll now turn to uh, Commissioner O'Donnell. He's actually an industry veteran, worked for 15 years at Calvert Cliffs uh, in Maryland in various capacities. He also served for more than eight years in the United States Navy's nuclear propulsion program. Uh, he's got a BS degree from uh, Regents College in Albany, now known as Excelsior College. Uh, he was appointed to the Maryland Public Service Commission in August of 2016. Uh, he's, a, as a member of NARUC, he's chairman of the <coughs> Subcommittee on Nuclear Issues and Waste Disposal. So. Uh, perfect person for this panel, and from, 20, uh, from uh, 1995 to 2016, he actually served in the Maryland House of Delegates. Uh, he served in a variety of leadership roles there, including the House Minority Whip and House Minority Leader, both of which, if anybody who follows state legislatures know, are tough battles, classic herding of cats. Uh, so with that explanation, the, the first sort of logical question, you've got experience as both the state legislator and now as a regulator, uh, reflecting on that experience, how does your time as a legislator inform uh, your work as a regulator? Thanks, Bill. I appreciate the question. I think I'll try to answer it by giving three examples. Okay. Uh, the first example was when I was working at Calvert Cliffs, I was also in the state legislature in 1999 taking part in the debates on deregulating our uh, electric generating industry. And we went in that year from a vertically integrated state to a competitive state with regard to generation. Um, so I was in the industry taking part in the, the debates on that in our legislature. Uh, we passed that, of course. But that experience uh, in the legislature also informs me today and gives me a better understanding, I believe, of, of the industry and, and how it, uh, what was intended, uh, what worked, and what did not uh, come to fruition as we anticipated it might uh, uh, when we passed that legislation. Uh, I would also say that uh, sometimes when you go from the role of a legislator to a regulator, uh, you have to check your personal positions. Uh, what do I mean by saying that? Um, we had a, a, a docketed piece of, um, uh, a docketed issue before the commission recently dealing with offshore wind. And when that legislation was in the legislature, I was still in the legislature, uh, I was its, um, one of its most ardent and vocal opponents. Um, the legislature passed the bill over my objections, and when I got to the commission, I had very different criteria to evaluate that, and I had to check my own position on that, and I ended up, uh, based on the legislative mandate and the very clear criteria that the legislature gave to the commission in evaluating the efficacy of offshore wind, I had to change my position. I supported it there because now I wasn't representing my constituency. I was taking a look at the very cr clear criteria that the legislature provided to me, and I had to do it that way. Uh, and lastly, I will say in, in 2016, I was appointed to the commission 
uh, and less than six months later, my uh, friend from Pennsylvania, uh, from the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission, Rob Powelson, who was president of NARUC at the time, uh, kind of metaphorically tapped me on the shoulder and said, we have a vacancy in our nuclear issues and waste disposal subcommittee, and, and I want you to be a, the chairman of that subcommittee, and no is not a an an, uh, potential answer, okay? <laughs> uh, so I took that job, um, and I appreciate that job, but only six months on the commission. You know, I'm not a, I don't fancy myself as a nuclear expert, to be honest with you. I can, I can do a surveillance test on a, a reactor protective system. I can do a tripping cow. I can even operate an emergency planning uh, uh, effort, but I uh, certainly don't feel like I'm a comprehensive expert on nuclear issues, but uh, I'm kind of dealing with that, and my experience in the legislature informs me of that. Two months after uh, Commissioner Powelson, who's now a FERC commissioner, appointed me um, to that chairmanship, I was before the House uh, uh, Government and Commerce Committee, excuse me, Energy and Commerce Committee uh, in the U.S. House of Representatives testifying on HR, what would become H.R. 3053, the Shimkus bill, um, on behalf of NARUC. That bill is something that I'm very proud of. I testified before two committees uh, on that bill in, in the Congress, and um, my time in the legislature allowed me to do that in relatively short order uh, uh, as chairman of a national NARUC uh, subcommittee. So uh, I know Stan will appreciate uh, the importance of that in on short order going before a committee on Capitol Hill to testify. Uh, it's a little bit different than what I dealt with 22 years in the state legislature, but it certainly was helpful. Just to ask a quick follow-up, and I apologize for the ad-lib nature of this follow-up. Uh, sometimes regulators are described, and I think in my own view, not correctly, as a fourth branch of government, somehow a co-equal branch with the le legislature. What I heard you say is you view your role on the Public Service Commission as implementing acts that are set forth by the legislature. Yeah, I mean, we do set policy, but it's... A it's a different kind of policy setting. It's within the confines and the construct of our Constitution mm -hmm. and the, the true uh, preeminent policy setting body in the state, which is the legislature of the state. And you, you mentioned the plenary powers of, of state governments and, and how that all works. And I agree with that and I take very, very seriously uh, my role as a regulator in carrying out and implementing uh, that kind of governmental scheme without uh, partiality or prejudice. Okay. We'll now turn to our host member of the panel, uh, uh, Commissioner Wise. I actually ran a statewide, I'm counting one, two, three, four times here in, uh, in Georgia uh, to be elected as a commissioner of the Georgia Public Service Commission. Uh, he was well prepared for that, though, by serving in local government prior to his time on the commission. He now is uh, a member of the Pendleton Group, so he is, as he said, hung out his shingle uh, in the consulting world. Uh, he, uh, from 2016 to 2017, served on the National Petroleum Council. He's been president of NARUC uh, for 2003 and 2004. Uh, so we've had two leaders of NARUC up here with us on the panel. Uh, during this time, uh, he helped build relationships uh, across the footprint with Congress, with federal agencies, with industry, with Wall Street, who we always forget. Good news, we're a trillion dollar industry. Bad news, we're a trillion dollar industry in terms of uh, uh, the utility side of the business. Uh, he's uh, twice been past president of the Southeastern Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, an excellent uh, organization uh, that certainly we have always enjoyed participating in at our company. He's uh, currently on the advisory council for the New Mexico State University Center for Public Utilities. So with that introduction, uh, you all in Georgia are, have moved forward with, uh, with, as was said earlier, the first new nuclear unit in decades, or new nuclear, uh, plant Vogel, new nuclear units, I should say. Uh, and like all big decisions, it's not been uh, it's something that has been greeted always with universal acclaim, but you all have kept the course. So what, what allowed you to sort of keep the course uh, and keep moving forward uh, on the commission with that? Well, I appreciate that very much. And having served on the Public Service Commission for, for 24 years, uh, the Commission is and has been supportive of the nuclear fleet in Georgia and is and has been and hopefully will continue to be supportive of Plant Vogel 3 and 4. Uh, so it shouldn't come as any surprise to anyone here is that I am an unabashed supporter and uh, a part of my continuing work to support nuclear power, I'm involved with the Nuclear Matters Advocacy Group. 
and I'm proud that I'm going to have the opportunity to continue to support uh, the nuclear fleet that gives us those, those low rates or, or affordable rates, reliable and uh, dependable generation. And certainly in my state, we've had some difficulties in, uh, in being the first on the block and continues to be first on, on, uh, in this country with new nukes. Uh, it, it takes a lot of different players to be involved, and certainly the Commission's been an important cog to that. But you heard from my governor, and, uh, and he truly is my governor. He's been a great governor uh, who is in his eighth year. And uh, so the partners in this project, ultimately, when we were facing the Westinghouse bankruptcy, it was important that the leadership in this state gave that positive word that the governor did. He kept the partners together. And where a cog fell in South Carolina, it did not happen in the state. It allowed the commission, by the way, and we're, we're a constitutional body, we're statutory. Uh, we listen to the legislature, we stand in line for our budget. But the bottom line is, is the commission is an autonomous group, commission sta elected statewide, that allows us to go ahead and do what we think is appropriate for the continued affordable rates, reliable, dependable generation in this state. And it's interesting, sometime this past year, one of the, and just let's call them an anti-group, they said, I'm tired of hearing about low rates or affordable rates and reliable, dependable uh, generation. And so I'm thinking, why? <laughs> and, and so part of what it has is the diversity in this state, uh, and the, the nuclear fleet is responsible, as you've heard a number of times this morning, for over half, almost 60 percent, of the emission-free generation in this country. And so the message is, is how do we get that out to the ratepayers in the state, the people that not only elect me or elected me, but continue to pay attention? Part of the reason is, is that it's, it's something that's lost. They're supportive of utilities in the state. They like those affordable rates. And, and they don't really pay attention. And as much as the media is working so hard this year to make the continuation of Plant Vogel 3 and 4 the message, I don't believe it's resonating with the electorate in this state because they know that they have those low rates or affordable rates and that they are dependable, reliable, and that the commission has done the thing for the, for the last three or four decades to make that happen. The southern states as a whole are that way as well. The southern states generally are autonomous, that we do not give up our authority to the organized markets. We can continue to keep our current fleet operating, and it is vital to this state. If we're going to see those dependable uh, transmission uh, in the state, and we're going to see the continued, we're, the, we're one of the fastest growing renewable states in the country, all without a mandate, mind you, but it can only happen because we have that adequate generation there that spends 24-7. And, and that's what the nuclear fleet gives us. That's what Plant Vogel 3 and 4 will give. It will allow this state to continue to maintain uh, the, that message for decades to come, perhaps even into the next century, if we see a, a plant that, is, that can be relicensed for 60 to 80 years. Good. Now, you had to run four times statewide, and there's two tenets of politics I remember. One is if you're explaining, you're losing. And the second, the consultants will always tell you that if you can't fit it into a, wor a sentence of less than 10 words, <laughs> it's too complicated an issue. And you had a job where you were responsible for energy issues, which, as we all know, are hard, nuanced, complicated issues. So how did you manage to do that? I asked people if they're happy with their utilities. And it doesn't matter whether it was a co-op or a city-owned or the investor-owned utility in our state, which serves only about half of, of this state. And so the question was, are you happy? And if you're not, why? And generally, it might have been, they might have touched a little bit on customer service, mm -hmm. but it was never about reliability, dependability, or affordable rates. Now, people would complain sometimes in August because, as, as those of you who know, it is hot and humid in this state. Air conditioning has saved and allowed the state to grow, uh, this state and the southern region to grow. And so we have a high usage of electricity, of energy in the summer months. But the bottom line is, folks generally are not unhappy. And despite the, 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 the budget and the schedule 
associated with Plant Vogel, we will turn those switch on in 2022. I'm now going to turn to some questions, uh, general questions for the panel. Very good. Uh, and the first, and this builds on, uh, on the, the remarks we just heard, and that is uh, we often talk at NEI meetings about how can nuclear insert itself better into clean energy conversations at the state level. How can it be, cons given that it is uh, the majority of carbon-free electricity in the United States, how do we tell that story better? And I'll invite each of the panel to say, what could the nuclear industry do better? Recognizing good successes, we should celebrate that. But in the nuclear business, we're never happy with good results in the past. We're looking at even better results in the future. What could the industry be doing better at the state level? I, I, would, oh, I would hope that, that, we, that we don't run from the issue, that we don't uh, ever apologize for what nuclear power has done for this, for this country, and that it is important that the technology continue to increase that we do have the opportunity to, to grow in the future the nuclear fleet. I am so encouraged by Connecticut, by New Jersey and the other states that have acknowledged the role of, of what that's about. And it has to be because of the advocacy groups of NEI and others that say, this is a good message and you don't run from it. And, uh, and so that's what we have in Georgia. And I believe that that's what's happening around the country. And that message is strong. And I don't think you can run from that. Representative Reed. So, you know, one thing that I think is really important is to interact as much as you can with legislators and let them know that they are stakeholders in this. Um, I always try to get the, um, because the workforces at the nuclear plants are so impressive. So I always try to get them to call their legislators and to get to know them and to let them know that they are taxpayers and voters. And um, because, I mean, I think, you know, you've all experienced this when you, you get very excited about what you do, but sometimes when you're talking to civilians, uh, they start looking at their cell phones, like their eyes glaze over with any energy discussion. So, you know, drive it home. And I also think, I mean, I've noticed, uh, and I, I'm so jealous that if you ask people in your state if they're happy with their utility, that's a rhetorical question in my state. No. We have the most expensive electricity in the, contigu in the contiguous United States. I think only Hawaii is more expensive than we are. And DREG has not done well by them, they, they've decided. So it's really contentious. And so any discussion of what might appear to be a subsidy gets... Um, so you just have to really tell the story. When um, the Domin one of the Dominion reactors was shut down for refueling, we had the dirtiest air in New England that we had had in 15 years. The dirtiest air, the spikes, um, because they had to turn on the peakers and the number six oil and all that kind of stuff. And we had fuel constraint, uh, you know, getting natural gas through pipelines to all of New England is very, very difficult. And we've switched generators over to um, natural gas, but also their dual fuel. So what happens immediately when you can't get enough gas is you turn on the, uh, the other. So really begin to re-educate and to keep educating. I think everybody thinks that people know this already, and they don't. And, um, and so it's, it's really important to keep telling the story. And uh, I would just add this uh, from a different perspective. Maria Korsnick talked about speaking to four state uh, groups of legislators. Part of that was uh, nascent efforts to develop uh, nuclear caucuses in the various state legislatures. That's so important uh, to have advocates inside the legislative body who understand the economic importance of our nuclear power plants. Look, I grew up in Middletown, Pennsylvania. You Exelon folks know what that is. Many of you know what that is. That's where Three Mile Island is. I know growing up as a kid and graduating from high school there in 1979 that the economic development and importance to the local economy was tremendous. My family members earned a living there. I go to Calvert County, and, and Maria knows this too, Calvert County was one of the poorest counties in the state of Maryland, within 50 miles of the na nation's capital, and was, was, had a school system that didn't function properly. It was, tar it was not good. It was very rural. It was, the, the tax base was very limited. And Calvert Cliffs came there and lifted that community up to, to today, where it has one of the best school systems in our state. Well, if you form 
a nuclear caucus in your legislator, get a handful, just a core of legislators to be able to tell that story. Similarly, just like I just did, they'll be your strongest advocates in your state legislature and they will help improve nuclear guaranteed. I guarantee it. To turn to the next question for the panel, then we're going to go a little early at audience questions. So think, start thinking about your audience questions here. And if not, I'm going to call on people. I know enough of you, don't worry. Kelly Chapman. So in any event, um, the, uh, during the Connecticut legislation, I'm sure this was true in some other states, there was some testimony that stand down state of Connecticut, the federal government's going to act at some point. You don't need to act. And similarly, in Washington, there's some discussion that stand down federal government, the states are taking action, you all can continue to be, uh, as Maria put it, very deliberative uh, in your actions. Uh, what's your reaction that if one level of government takes action, does that mean the other level should just wave off? Or is there a way for both the federal and state level to work cooperatively on, on the nuclear issue? Clearly, the, the opportunity to continue Plant Vogel was that that partnership mm -hmm. with the NRC, with the DOE, ultimately the Congress extended production tax credits. If those partnerships had not all been put in place and continued to advocate for the continued construction of Vogel, we would not be here talking today uh, about the future of Vogel three and four. I, you know, I, one of my big frustrations is how little um, ISO New England really participates in this. It, it, this is a regional asset. And, um, and they tell us, you know, when we first brought them in, because we want to have this conversation, you know, why aren't you helping to figure out a way to keep Dominion going? And, oh, well, that's a state initiative. We only care about security and reliability. And I kept saying, this is security and reliability. <laughs> you know, I, I don't get the disconnect. So that's a frustration. Actually, I was texting um, Kevin Hennessy, one of your top people uh, this morning, he's in Maine at a, at a, regulation, a regulators uh, conference and ISO New England is there. And I said, go kick some ISO butt. Mm. You know, they really have to not only recognize but acknowledge because as a region, we really need to cobble together, um, you know, these, um, these models so that we can, you know, really know that it, it, it impacts the entire region. And I, um, Governor Deal was talking earlier, I was so jealous, um, of the manufacturing that's moving in here. And Connecticut is a manufacturing state, and we've lost serious manufacturing. But we're beginning to grow Sikorsky. We were able to keep Sikorsky, uh, which was uh, just bought by Lockheed Martin, and we thought they were going to move their manufacturing out of Connecticut. Um, and we're expanding electric boat for our nuclear um, submarine fleet. And uh, so uh, we keep telling that story. And, what, and what's that gonna, how's that going to impact the rest of the economics of the region? You start just the idea of losing nuclear. That just, why don't you just say goodbye economic development? And, uh, you know, so that as a region really needs to be told. And then the other thing that we have going on in our region is everybody loves renewables intellectually until they come to a neighborhood near them. And, um, New England's very densely populated and it's got a very uh, ferociously active um, um, you know, number of constituents and they're fabulous. But we've been having terrible issues with siting. So now you talk about grid scale renewables and suddenly people who love them, they've now coming to a farm field. I like that as a farm field. You know, What are we doing? We need to put a moratorium. So actually they sneaked in a moratorium of um, renewables on all farm fields and forests in Connecticut last session, which I'm getting removed. Um, but this is the kind of lunacy that begins to happen. People are not connected. We want zero carbon, we want zero carbon. Um, but don't put that in my field. And actually one of the wind developers taught me this phrase, which you've probably heard for a million years, but I hadn't heard it before. He said, we've gone from NIMBY to banana build absolutely nothing anywhere near anybody. <laughs> and, you know, FERC has to help us with that. You know, we have to be helped with that. As the uh, great Vic Thomas, a uh, former member of the Virginia legislature, used to say about taxes, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. <laughs> uh, Commissioner O'Donnell, uh, Maryland, like Virginia, is in the shadow of the federal government right next door. Uh, do you see a role for both the federal and state government on nuclear issues? 
I do, um, but we have an internal challenge, in my opinion, in, in Maryland, and specifically at my commission. When I got to, to uh, my commission in 2016, and this is not to be pejorative, but I was, because I'm a nuclear person, you kind of think, everybody thinks like you do, but they don't. <laughs> and I found that in our commission internally, the, the ability to discuss nuclear was, had, had evaporated, and it evaporated very quickly over about 10 years, I think, because of the push for renewables. So people were not conversant um, internal to our commission with regard to the, the uh, current trends and issues in nuclear. I'm set about trying to change that, uh, and I have been, and I've been meeting with some success there. Uh, but we gotta revitalize our thinking. Everybody was thinking for 10 years about windmills and solar and you know, yeah. renewable portfolio yeah. standards and, and power and energy efficiencies, but we didn't think about the, the nuclear power plant and the impact on Maryland's economy and its position in the, in the federal system in the, in the nation. And uh, I'm changing that internally. I do think there's a role for partnership, though. I think it's a very important role. Um, uh, state regulatory bodies and FERC uh, specifically have a role to work together to implement the, the policies that will value nuclear appropriately. And I share some of the frustration I'm hearing with regard to uh, RTOs, ISOs, and, and their kind of uh, incursion into the state's ability to uh, set policy because that's not the way our system of governance works. And uh, uh, there's trouble brewing on the horizon if that trend continues, I can guarantee you that. And let me just feed off that because the southern states, the far northwestern states, really strongly opposed formations of RTOs and ISOs in the day. Uh, we made some extraordinary enemies in the federal government, including the chairman of the FERC, the president of the United States, who was supportive of the new organized markets. But we were prepared to go ahead and stake ourselves out to say, we are not going to give away that reliable, dependable, and for transmission that, we, that, that the rate payers in the southern states had paid for. And so today, we have and continue to keep that choice, to be able to keep Hatch Vogel one and two up and running for another 20 to 30, maybe 40 years. Very good. We're going to now turn to audience questions. And yes, I'm holding note cards in my hand. So you all have used a state of the art app. You've submitted your questions using that state of the art app. And due to moderator limitations, I have had them reduced to uh, <laughs> three by five cards, which I can now read to you. So in any event, the first one we've got, I think this is a great question. Uh, and this is sort of, uh, can you have a Paul on the road to Damascus moment for folks who are opposed to nuclear? So the question is, what are reasons that people who are opposed to nuclear power give, and can they be swayed? Are there arguments we can make uh, that, can help sway, uh, that can help sway opponents of the industry at the state level? And I'll take it, Commissioner O'Donnell, you seem like you want to jump in. So, so I, I think you. one of the threshold issues is the nuclear waste issue, and that's one yeah. of the first things you hear from people. Mm -hmm. How are you going to solve the nuclear waste issue? And, uh, and I think we're making some progress after the issue being frozen nationally for a long, long time. Uh, the passage of 3053 on a strong bipartisan vote over to the Senate gives us hope that someday we'll, we're going to have a, a bill that, that compromises the, uh, uh, the two positions of the, the House and the Senate and gets, gets us to solving that problem. Uh, so uh, if we can solve that, then you can start getting past some of the issues with regard to the, the positive attributes of, of uh, nuclear and really having a good discussion. I don't think we should wait for, for a permanent solution to the waste issue, but if we have progress on it, then we can get to the next level of discussion, which is the zero emissions generation uh, attributes, the resiliency and reliability attributes, and all the other good things that nuclear brings to us. We've got a related question for Representative Reed, and I'm gonna editorialize on this. Uh, the question is, by and large, anti-nuclear advocates align with your party, in other words, they're Democrats, and how do you get, how, how are you able to talk to your fellow Democrats? What I'm going to editorialize here, I think sometimes we lose sight of my observation in politics, the very far left and the very far right have far more in common than either of them would like to believe. We were talking about that at our little pre-panel uh, coffee clash this morning, so I think sometimes left and right and party labels are not as useful as perhaps folks would think. And again, exactly as designed. The founders were very suspicious of parties, very suspicious of permanent majorities, and the system is working exactly as designed. But having said that, 
in Connecticut, you had some folks who were very passionately opposed to nuclear. Were you able to sway any of them during, in talking with your caucus? Well, I was, actually, and, and, and I'm a Democrat. So my caucus was initially really opposed to uh, this legislation. I mean, a, a few members, and clearly members that represent areas where Millstone um, you know, is located, um, got it immediately. But um, you know, it, it was really sort of bringing people on board. And I know a lot of people don't like to talk about global warming, but that is your friend. <laughs> Go there. Talk about global warming really make the case that, uh, that we have a technology <laughs> that is zero carbon. And yes, we're, we need to deal with that waste issue, but to you know, really tell that story again and again. But the other thing I noticed, and as a journalist, um, I'm always looking for what people's motivations are. And there's a misperception that it's all you know, Democrats and little. Some of the, the most, um, the, the lobbyists who put the most amount of money in the anti-nuke movement in Connecticut for this legislation. Um, there was something called the Coalition to Stop the Millstone Payout. So, you know, again, journalists who don't know energy, will rep and I'm going, who are these people? They were the gas companies. <laughs> the direct competitors created this pretense of, uh, oh, we're environmentally, um, you know, sane, and they're, you know. So you really have to know Who's feeding this monster? And the other uh, one was interesting, the AARP. So we're a state of 3.2 million people. We're a little state. Um, but suddenly AARP corporate, as I call them, we're dumping a lot of money into anti-millstone. Uh, um, you know, in fact, they, some of them were saying, we just ought to shut it down. I mean, talk about a disconnect. So I started, I think, well, why are they dumping so much money into Connecticut? And, I, and all the, you know, the local folks that they deploy with their little red shirts showed up because they were told you've got to be anti-nuclear. I'm like, what is going on with this? So I started doing some due diligence, and I discovered that the president of AARP corporate at that point was one of the top energy lawyers in this country who uh, represented natural gas and wind farms. So suddenly, you know, he's risen to lead this organization. And when I spoke to the AARP leadership um, in Connecticut, they really didn't understand it. They just said, no, it's wrong. Our, you know, our corporate is telling us that we need to. So you really also have to dig deep to look at all the layers of who's really involved in this, because a lot of it is your direct competitors. Let the record show the moderator remained stoic and made no comment during that discussion. <laughs> in, in, in Cool Hand Luke, the warden said, you know, there's just some folks you can't reach. Yeah. And, and yeah. I think we have to acknowledge that there's some people that refuse to accept the facts and, and, and the reality of the real world. I'm opposed to coal. Why? Well, it's those dirty emissions. Well, what about nuclear power where it's clean? Uh, well, no, we don't want nuclear either, yeah. but we want renewables, all renewables all the time. And uh, well, what about the intermittency? Well, we don't care. We want to be a 100% renewable state. The only way you can be 100% or even 50% is something's out there spending night and day hot and cold. And that's what we get from that next generation. And that actually is a good lead into the next question. I'm going to insert an editorial comment here, though, on uh, natural gas and nuclear. Dominion Energy, as some of you all know, is a major, major natural gas company. Natural gas local distribution companies, natural gas pipelines, natural gas export at Calvert County, Maryland. Good point. We love natural gas at Dominion, major part of our business, and we are still all in on nuclear. The two are absolutely reconcilable, and both are part of a reasonable energy portfolio. Now, all of you uh, on the panel have had the uh, i have had the pleasure of being in politics in one form or another in your careers. A lot of folks in the audience would be fair to say, government, who in here thought that government or political science was their favorite class? Raise their hand. All right. <laughs> Only a few, okay? We've got folks who are, uh, who are maybe not as versed in politics, but by being here, they, they're showing, they know that public policy is important, that it matters. What advice would you give for somebody uh, maybe they're working at a technical center for a utility. Maybe they're working at a plant. Maybe they're working in a more technical role at a trade association or at a consulting firm. What advice do you give to someone who wants to start getting involved in advocacy at the state level? Not necessarily running for office, but just helping do issue advocacy. What advice would you give? I'll start with uh, Commissioner Wise. I, it's, it's, we do see that. 
and we see people attend our meetings, become involved, have a right for public comment, and uh, pro and con. And uh, the committees at the legislature are filled with, with advocates, teachers, nurses, uh, and, and, uh, and I think that is an extraordinary way to start. And if you don't want to come to the state capitol, go to your school board meetings, your county commissions, your city councils, and you have the opportunity to see government at work. And it, it truly is uh, your, your government. Mr. O'Donnell? I, I would agree with everything that Stan just said and, and also say this. If you develop relationships with your elected officials, whether they are school board or county commissioners or state legislators, uh, on a regular basis, and they know your feelings about the importance of your industry and what you do and where it should go in the future, uh, they'll think about you when they have to make critical policy decisions. They, you will stay in their thought process because you develop that relationship, and I think that's important. So don't be shy about making friends with or engaging with your elected officials. It's very important in terms of the future of the industry. Representative Breed. I totally agree with that, and I think also, as I, I always tell people, I always talk chair of the Bioscience Caucus, and I'm always telling scientists and engineers, don't wait until we're in session and come up to the Capitol, and it's just this huge army of people trying to get our attention. Call your legislators um, out of session. Call them locally. Have them come visit your company. Have them meet your colleagues. You know, really create a relationship. Really communicate. Know your audience and really communicate because that pays dividends. When people feel connected to you um, and they sit in the legislature, suddenly, you know, you have an avenue through. So when you come, I mean, I always say, and these are complicated things. You're trying to tell a legislator who's running between and among committees and has deadlines galore, talking about a complicated technical issue and they're meeting you for the first time. That to me is, um, you know, that's not necessarily going to ever work. So it's really important to kind of uh, set the table and, and keep doing it and to run for office. We really, really need more engineers and more scientists and, and, and more people who have this kind of knowledge in our legislatures because that's when, I always say, things happen in the room. When you are in the room making policy and you respect the intelligence and the experience of your colleagues, you're going to listen to those people. And, and so we really need um, more of you folks in our legislature. But if you run, if Bill runs, he better put on his armor because uh, people have no filter. The extremes right and left yeah. will call you names uh, and you better be prepared to deal with it. If you lose your temper, you're done. Uh, so. uh, that reminds me of a great Virginian Senator John Warner, the retired Senator Warner, not the current Senator Warner. Uh, I saw him get booed once in Virginia Beach over jet noise uh, from the Oceana Naval Base. And I remember his reaction. He said, I love that sound. It's the sound of freedom. And that was the end <laughs> of the booing. But always, uh, when that, that is a good example of uh, uh, Senator Warner started every day, actually it's true, the current Senator Warner too, thinking only of the glass being half full, not half empty. Mm -hmm. If you think that way, then maybe politics is in your future. So Representative Reed, we've got a question for you here. Uh, let's say one of your counterparts, a state energy chair from another state with an at-risk nuclear unit, or maybe multiple at-risk nuclear units, calls you out of the blue and says, Representative Reed, I think they're serious this time. We've actually got to take action. We've dealt with, you know, we've been putting this issue long enough. We've got to take action. What should I do? What advice can you give me as a legislative leader who wants to move on this issue? So one thing that I've been doing a lot of is I really do think we need to deal not only as a New England region, but as a Northeast region. So I just went to a conference, participated in a conference last weekend in Princeton, New Jersey with legislators from um, Maryland and New Jersey and New York and Pennsylvania. Um, in addition to New England. And we're trying to create a working group that's going to come up with some really good models and, and also um, some ability to connect and give this kind of advice in an ongoing way. And, and, and I think in every state's unique in terms of their structure and their regulatory environment. Somebody was telling me in New York, um, you know, it's the energy czar who really runs things in New York. The legislators don't have a lot of interaction, you know, so, so each state is a bit different, but in the final analysis, you really need to pull together, you know, some sort of a construct that everybody can relate to, and that really helps going forward. Okay. 
Would either of you like to add to that? I just I think it dovetails with what I said earlier, which is forming uh, those nuclear caucuses in that working group and coming up yeah. with uh, legislative strategies very very important. If we wait for NCSL or other trade groups to do it, it's probably yeah. not going to happen. It's probably going to have to come from within. Okay. Uh, we've been sort of hitting around this question, and I'll ask it more directly. We're in an era of very strong feelings in American politics. So you've got, uh, I read somewhere, it's sort of 40, 40, 20. You've got 40% of one party, 40% of the other party, 20% in the middle. And there was a time when it used to be, and this was routine in state legislatures, Congress, members of both parties would socialize together. That's still true to some degree at the state level, much less true at the federal level. We have uh, talk, uh, talk uh, or uh, not talk radio, but we have cable news where if you align to one party, you can watch one network. If you align to another, you can watch, another, you can watch, uh, watch the other network. Uh, folks really uh, have very strong emotions, very strong feelings about things. Energy by its nature is a bipartisan issue. So how do you keep energy bipartisan at a time where things are more and more partisan? And I would go beyond partisan and say almost tribal in terms of how people think about things. Because Lord knows, and we're going to see this today in Georgia, in the two primaries, there's plenty of intra-party fights in addition to inter-party fights going on. What advice would you give for the industry in wanting to stay rel relentlessly bipartisan? And, and I'm not sure that, that you can solve that. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think that's the very nature of the republic, of, of, the, of the opportunity to hear and listen uh, and follow that news, whether it's accurate or not. Unfortunately, with, with uh, social media, sometimes you get things that aren't accurate. And as I said earlier, uh, the, the debate uh, in the political realm is, as we're having today and the primaries that are being held today, they, they're making the issue Vogel uh, because they have nothing else to run on. Uh, so it's, it's the, the budget overruns, the schedule, whether they understand it or not. Even if they, do, if they knew that half of that 10% in increase in rates were already in rates today and they're not complaining about rates, that's the message that's almost impossible to get out to the average rate payer, to the average voter. So I, I don't know how you solve that problem. Well, Commissioner O'Donnell, Maryland has an overwhelmingly Democratic uh, legislature, overwhelming registration managed for Democrats, and a Republican governor who, as far as I can tell, polls off the charts. Uh, what, how has Maryland found, and from what I can tell in Maryland, the legislature, the governor, I'm sure they're arguments and disagreements, but seem to be working very amicably together. How is Maryland able to act in such a bipartisan way? Well, I, I, I think it's, um, if, if everybody goes to their extreme polls yeah. and you get so polarized, you, you can't find a way to work together. It's just impossible. This country right now, in my opinion, is, is at a heightened level of polarization, and therefore it makes it very difficult. In Maryland, I don't think we quite see that polarization with our current government. A split government, Republican governor, Democrat legislature. So there is an opportunity to work together. There was an opportunity for the governor to support increasing our uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction as a Republican uh, to 40 percent and supported by the legislature. When you can work together on those types of initiatives, it's important. And nuclear will play an important role in us meeting that state policy goal. So you can use those state policies to foster bipartisanship and this industry will certainly benefit by that as we try to uh, preserve our nuclear fleet and innovate and hopefully someday grow it. Representative Reed, as you alluded to earlier, your Senate in Connecticut's literally tied, seemingly divided. House is very closely divided. How are you all, and you all are doing some very significant things policy-wise, including the nuclear legislation, but a number of other matters. How have you all been able to succeed in, uh, in being bipartisan? I think one thing, and of course, people do go to their extreme corners, but um, as I always tell various members of my committee, do not feed the snark fest. Do not go there. When somebody's coming at you like that, just keep saying, well, you know, I really want to hear. You know, I mean, respect other people's views. And I've had situations where people were really, you know, anti whatever um, legislation we were trying to do, but because I listened, and kept bringing them into the conversation. And I get what you're saying. Oh, well, I, I can see why, you know, you, you can kind of authenticate that they're not crazy. And you kind of can get, you know, that they, and try, and try to understand that. And I've, you can get people to stand down. So they may not vote with you, but they'll stand down. 
and be real quiet suddenly when the boat comes up. And just that to me is a yes, <laughs> you know? Just working it as human beings, as human beings, it's, it's so important. You know, it's the kind of thing that we all grow up knowing that our moms and dads teach us, treat people with respect, and we lose it sometimes when we get, you know, we start getting wound up by the rhetoric. Mm -hmm. I always call it robotic rhetoric, and suddenly you can see people park their brains and just go into the script. Yeah. I try to break through that, and I think the more we do that and, and listen and make people feel heard, um, you know, that's the only way through. Okay. Now, t for our last question, and this was written by somebody who I think has potential as a candidate because they're glass half full. They'd like to know what is the single best argument at the state level for nuclear power, and they'd like each of the panelists to react for that. I like that. We've had questions about opponents and about persuading people, but what's the single most effective argument? Let's start I, with the I think, again, that it allows for the growth of, of renewables, and, and that is just extraordinary to think that nuclear power has the position that it can allow that solar community to grow uh, because of the 24-7 nature of uh, spinning generation. Mr. O'Donnell? In, uh, I'll speak from Maryland's perspective. In Maryland, we're a relatively progressive state politically um, and in energy policy, decidedly so. Um, and I think the strongest argument for nuclear is reminding people, especially the progressives who may not have thought much about nuclear recently, that we can't meet our state policy goals, our aggressive, ag very aggressive greenhouse gas emission reduction uh, policies our renewable portfolio standard policies, our desire to clean our air uh, and our water and clean up the Chesapeake Bay if we don't have nuclear. We can never meet those goals, and they need to be reminded of that. They need to be reminded of it continuously. Representative Reed, last word. Jobs, 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 economic development, clean environment. And we're <coughs> done with 37 seconds to spare, and somebody blew out a mic probably Woo! me. So that, that woke everybody out. Thank you for a very good panel. Let the record show no PowerPoint was involved. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. No cough button on these. Excellent job. Thank you very Thank much. You very good much. panel.